Thank you, Jerry, for allowing us the opportunity to keep everybody informed of what's going on. I think everyone is aware that the PAST Act um, is out there, um, and I, we wanted to take an opportunity to update everyone from both the legislative angle and the regulatory angle of kind of where the industry finds itself at the current time. We've had uh, three uh, meetings, um, two in Shelbyville, one in, in North Carolina. So we're doing our best uh, to keep everybody informed, to be as transparent as possible. There are no secrets. There are no um, hidden details to this. This is all out in the open. This is all information basically you can find uh, on your own. We just wanted to make it very easy for people to uh, hear it direct and, and get a, a what's going on currently in the industry. So the PAST Act has two angles. We talked about the legislative and the regulatory. From a legislative standpoint, um, the PAST Act did pass out of committee. I think that vote was 46 to 9. It is a, a live bill, but it has not been scheduled uh, for any vote. Um, and so I think most people are aware that Congress is on break until after the election, so they'll be back November the 14th. Um, and um, there's a legislative session that would be until uh, the break for Thanksgiving. They'll come back in December. Again, depending on a lot of what happens in the election, November the 8th. Uh, will determine the agenda moving forward. But uh, as a standalone bill, there's, there's not a consensus amongst anyone uh, for or against a past act that that would go through or have the time to go through in this legislative session. So there'll be another one that starts with the new Congress at the first of the year. Definitely, we have our lobbyists. We have our Tennessee, Kentucky, mainly Southeastern um, uh, elected officials very much aware of what's going on. Um, and uh, so we don't, we do not believe that the legislative route will be uh, a successful one for those that are uh, proponents of the PAST Act. In regards to rulemaking, um, there are two rules. There's the old rule from 2017. Just to bring everybody quickly up to speed on that, that is the rule that we went through a comment period on. It, it, uh, that rule right there um, prohibited the pad, the action device, bans, and eliminated the HIOs. To remind you, the action devices were gone, uh, would be taken 30 days after publication in the Federal Register. The pads uh, uh, would be, uh, not be taken in, uh, until one year from publication in the Federal Register, and the HIOs would be one year from publication in that. So we went through that, we filed comments uh, previously to that. The USDA did not change the rule based upon our comments. They published it on their website, but prior to it going to the Federal Register, uh, President Trump um, was elected, inaugurated, and just like previous administrations, put a hold to all rules uh, that had not yet been uh, printed in the Federal Register. So that's why that rule didn't go into effect. Um, one of the things that people need to make sure you are aware is rulemaking is real, rulemaking is final. Um, the rulemaking is what implemented the SCAR rule in 1979, eliminated the 10 ounce chain. Uh, in 1988, developed the current heel-toe uh, ratio, uh, even actually took the pad initially away. However, the AVMA, AAP, many people came to the defense uh, uh, of the pad and thus it was uh, allowed to uh, stay in, but we came away with a, a short or smaller heel-toe ratio as a part of that. So, um, so that rule, um, the USDA formally withdrew that rule formally in 2021. Upon them um, issuing that withdrawal, it came out, we published that. They said that they were removing that rule because uh, they were going to expeditiously file a new rule that um, took into account the information in the 2017 rule, but also additional facts and data that had come uh, in the last five years, most notably the National Academies of Science study uh, that was jointly funded by the industry and the USDA. So um, when it was formally withdrawn, the HSUS, the Humane Society, sued the USDA. Um, in the district court in DC, um, the USDA prevailed uh, and that court ruled that no, the rule was not final and it could be withdrawn because it had never been printed in the Federal Register, which is, as most would say, the, the, the thing that has to happen. It's the final uh, step to any rule becoming official. Um, HSUS appealed that um, and were represented by a very, very prominent firm, Latham and Watkins um, in Washington, D.C., actually represented pro bono 
um, so they didn't pay for that defense. Um, but in a split decision in the Court of Appeals, a two to one decision, um, they overturned the lower court's ruling. Um, and they said that it had met the threshold and because it had been put out on the USDA's website as final, that it did not have to wait uh, on just the publication in the Federal Register for it to be uh, final. That ruling surprised uh, most everyone because that's a long-standing uh, regulatory threshold that it would have to meet. So um, initially at that point in time, that happened right before this year's celebration. Um, the industry, upon hearing that, we had already retained a firm, Ellis, George, and Cipollone, um, to represent us in the new rule that would file the comments. We had a different firm, uh, a different lawyer that did it in 2016 and 17, and so we had, so at that point, uh, given not knowing whether the USDA, and it would actually be the Department of Justice on behalf of the DOJ, if they were going to appeal that uh, Court of Appeals ruling, we retained our firm and they filed a motion to intervene uh, on behalf of the celebration. And um, so we filed that motion. Um, we also filed a petition for rehearing. So the deadline for everyone on that was October the 6th. So on October the 6th, um, the DOJ did appeal the Court of Appeals ruling. Um, what does that mean? They actually appealed a portion of it uh, they did not appeal that the rule had met the threshold to be final. What they appealed was and asked for a removal of a couple of paragraphs of the opinion of the Court of Appeals is they wanted to allow the lower court, the district court, which is where the, the, it was remanded back to them, that they would have wide discretion in what is the remedy of that. And so the USDA clearly does not want to implement the old rule because they have a new rule coming. So that appeal did happen, so that is the process with which we're in right now. It's somewhat of a waiting game. The court has not ruled on the motion to intervene or the petition rehearing for rehearing in the industry. The main difference in our petition for rehearing versus the Department of Justice's is, is we both appealed that it had not met the threshold, that that was a bad decision by the court, that an improper decision by, by the Court of Appeals, and that it does have to be published to become final. And then a, an alternative to that, also similarly to the DOJ, the remedy part of it and what discretion the lower court has uh, to not have to implement that. So um, depending on the outcome of those appeals, depending upon whether or not we're granted the motion to intervene, and depending upon what the remedy is for the 2017 rule, what they do with it, are they able to withdraw it or do they have to go forward with it, um, we could be faced with having to file comments again. They would have to go out for notice and comment. Some of the effective dates and things of that are old. Um, the effective dates are actually all in 2017 and 2018. So we would be forced to file comments on that. And then if they didn't change, well, they would not change any of the wording in it, we would, um, as an industry, file, um, pursue litigation um, with regards to that and what we don't feel like is right in that rule. So that's the, the most current information on the 2017 rule. Let's talk about the 2022 rule. I've already told you, T to again, when they withdrew uh, in late 2021, uh, the old rule, they said um, and have done, uh, that they would expeditiously file a, a new rule. So they have internally drafted that rule and that rule currently is at the Office of Management and Budget. That rule went from USDA to OMB uh, on September the 2nd. That's the second Friday of this year's celebration. OMB um, has a 90-day period that they can go through a review of that um, and doesn't mean that they're going to take the full 90 days, um, but I don't know exactly how, how pressing this issue is for them. So. Um, if you say 90 days, that would be 1st of December uh, before they would send the rule back um, to USDA. At that point in time, um, the USDA would publish the rule as a proposed rule with a comment period. That comment period is stated in their previous release on this rule as a 60-day time period. We asked for an extension and were granted last time. Uh, 
up to 90 days, uh, from 60 to 90. And so most of us, um, through just what it, information is out there, um, suspect that the 2022 rule will do similar things um, and similar things that the industry is in opposition to, um, such as the, the ban of pads, action device, hoof bands, weighted shoes, um, elimination of the HOs, um, and so, and just the burdens, if people get into the nuts and bolts of reading th this rulemaking, the, the change to show management and how hard and more expensive it will be uh, to have horse shows. One of the things that I think our industry has um, allowed it itself to, to take on is, is that this is about our performance show horse and not our pleasure show horse. No, 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 this is about all show horses. And so that's a, that's a very uh, distinct thing that people need to understand is, is this is not just for our padded Tennessee walking horses a rule for them. There are many things that will affect all aspects um, of what we do. So um, once we file the comment, uh, the comments, obviously a lot of people will file comments. I think there were 100,000 comments or whatever it was last time. Um, the USDA reviews those comments, has a time period of which uh, that they would review all those. Um, the important part for us, for everyone, in regards to the comment period is um, if we don't make the argument and the factual basis for those arguments in the, in the comment period, we can't litigate on those issues or, cre or bring something up that wasn't on the record um, to, file, to file litigation. So that's why the comment period for us is so important. It's why it's going to be very expensive. Um, is all of the industry's arguments as to why what we do is okay and what we want um, for our show horse. It has to be in there or we cannot raise it. That'd be the same for the others. Their justification for why they are taking the pad, the action device, the ban, all of those, obviously that would have to be on the record as well. So it would be a closed record case um, if we were to file uh, litigation. So. At this point in time, it's premature to say that we definitely will because we haven't seen what's in the rule. So until we see what is in the rule, um, it is somewhat premature, but granted they said they're going to strengthen the 17 rule. I think it's safe for us to assume that many of the things that we're in opposition to will be uh, included. So at that point in time, the USDA will get the final rule, which also then goes back to the Office of Management and Budget for another 90 day or up to 90 day review period. So at that point in time, we can also request meetings with uh, the Office of Management and Budget. We actually can request those meetings um, in either time of their review. So from a strategic standpoint and, and what we feel like is best, we, we definitely will follow the advice of the attorneys uh, who are very well versed in, in regulatory law and, and, and definitely somebody that we feel very confident um, uh, that is, is representing our best interest in the best way. So um, OMB, once they are done with it, it goes back to the department, any changes that they recommend are made, and then it is published on their website as a final rule that has been sent to um, the Federal Register for publication. So it got to exactly that phase. So OMB sent the rule back to USDA last time as final, it was put on their website. We all got to read what was going to be in it. It had just not been published. So we've gotten all the way to that stage previously. We just didn't get to implementation of it before. So I think um, staying in touch with um, leadership from the breeders, the trainers, um, owners, the celebration, um, everyone is going to be kept 100% in the loop on this. We talk regularly with the heads of those organizations. Um, we are keeping everyone in the loop. It's the purpose of today and, and Jerry allowing us to do this um, is, is that that is our um, main objective is, is that everyone feels like um, that they're uh, knowledgeable, that they know what's going on so that when you're out making decisions um, that you kind of know exactly where, where things stand. Um, questions, if you have any questions of us, uh, I think Jerry's going to put my email uh, on the screen um, where you can send me an email. You can also ask questions of the president of the trainers, a board member of the trainers, a board member of TWEBA, anyway. But my email's there. It's jhoward at horseworld.net. Um, I'm happy to, I don't 
necessarily have all the answers, but I can get you uh, the answer um, from one of the experts that we're dealing with. And um, so again, I just want to make sure that people are well aware um, of where things stand and don't feel like things are happening that you don't know about. Um, this is a, a, a very critical and important time for us. Um, we feel very confident in uh, our data, uh, the data from inspection. Um, uh, it's better now than it was uh, when they went um, trying to do the 2017 rule. Um, and so we're going to uh, definitely uh, defend our show horse uh, to the maximum degree, and that's what this is about. There is going to be a fundraising element to this. I think everyone would be aware that no entity in our business uh, has uh, the appropriate funds um, to, to fight something like this and the multiple stages that are involved in this. Um, there will be multiple phases to this. There will be the comment period phase. Uh, there could potentially be a uh, to seek a stay against the implementation of the rule while um, the third phase of that would be uh, litigation to challenge the validity of the rule. So um, I think if you read Kevin Shea's um, announcement regarding the, the rule or, or when he was interviewed about it, uh, one of the reasons that they took a little extra time, one of the reasons they're dotting their I's, crossing their T's is they too know that the industry intends to defend itself and, and that there's a high likelihood of litigation to, to solve this. So um, a couple of questions that have come up during um, some of the sessions that we've had. Um, if you donate money, if it's not necessary to, to uh, litigate this matter, would you get your money back? The answer to that is yes. Where can you um, donate? Um, you can donate to the foundation, which is FAST, uh, known in the industry. It's a 501c3. Um, and 100% um, of the money that is donated will go to no administrative cost. It'll go directly to the firm representing us in this matter. So um, the amount spent versus what we think the budget is of what we're trying to raise, um, that'd be prorated. You would get that percentage of your money back if, it, if we don't go forward. Again, I can't imagine that we wouldn't be forced to go through all phases of this. Um, however, you know, it's until we see the rule, it is, it is premature for us to, to say what we are going to do. So um, fundraising has gone well. Um, the breeders, the trainers, the celebration um, have all uh, contributed with major donations um, and through industry participants and, and other avenues there have been some very creative fundraising ideas. The United We Stand Horse Show uh, the second weekend in November uh, in Tunica, all proceeds from that show um, will go towards this um, and so that's a joint effort of the, tw uh, the breeders, the celebration, the trainers, and FAST, so those four organizations are putting on a show. None of them individually are managing that show. There was a show manager hired, but um, it's, it's kind of a collective effort to, to, one, go back to Tunica, because we used to have a show there, uh, as well as be able to raise money uh, from that show that will help uh, with the, the legal fund. The Wagonhorse Report and other media uh, will be kept abreast of the fundraising and, and how it's going and how much we exactly need and, and how much of that we, we have already gotten and what will remain. Uh, but we feel confident from the early uh, returns on that that we'll be able to raise the necessary funds to defend our show horse um, and make sure that we are well represented and, and that our interests are well represented. So um, again, just to summarize kind of possible outcomes here, um, the 17 rule, depending on what happens in that appeal, what the lower court rules, we could be forced to, to challenge that rule. Um, the 22 rule is definitely in the pipeline, is definitely coming. Um, I haven't heard this question, but others have said that people think, well, you know, I don't know if this is going to happen, or, uh, you know, wait and see. No, 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 it is happening. I um, mean, the USDA has been very clear, um, and, and it has now sent this rule to the OMB. So it is coming. It, it's, it's not a if this is happening, it is simply when. And that timeline that I went through I mean, it could be. You could, you could find us in uh, a year or even longer uh, process here. So this will not be quick, but it won't also. We had asked the attorneys, you know, how long would the litigation phase be? With a closed record case like that, they said that it, it won't, there won't be discovery and things like that that drag on. So, you know, 12 to 18 month uh, timeline is what they gave us. I think that was obviously a, a best guess. 
Um, so again, this could be something. The other reason uh, that's important is for fundraising. Um, the, the, the fundraising and the uh, budget set forth by our attorneys was in, in those three phases. It would be in the uh, comment phase, it would be in the seeking the stay, uh, and then the litigation phase. So there are three phases to that. So it's not necessary to have all of the money raised or the needed funds allocated to start, um, but if we don't have the, the funding that it will allow us to have the flexibility to seek relief from it, there's really no reason to file the comments uh, or pay for the, those comments because that would be the purpose in filing the comments is, is what we oppose in the rulemaking. So um, again, any questions, feel free to email or ask um, your, your leadership in, in your area. We, we are trying our best to keep everyone informed, um, the rack and horse to spotted. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an issue that just as Tennessee walking horses, they are involved. The rack and horse association has contributed, uh, very generously, uh, to it. Alabama, North Carolina, Maury County Horsemen's Association. People are starting to understand the impact of this and, and what impact it is on show management, the charities that benefit from our horse shows, as horse shows become more expensive to have, who would suffer right there? Uh, it, the person paying it, but also the charity that is being able to raise money. So you can just take um, and, and filter that down. And so, um, again, thank you, uh, Jerry. Thank you, What a Horse. Thank you uh, to, to all those that have participated in, in the meetings. Um, Frank Eichler has been um, wonderful uh, to work with and, and uh, definitely does a better job of explaining the legal things than I have. Uh, Steve Smith uh, as well, um, Casey Kessel ring with Fast, uh, Bill Young with the trainers, Mark Fair, Jack Heffington with, with the breeders. Uh, again, this is a very much a collective effort. It's not uh, my effort or the, just the celebration's effort. It's this industry's effort. And so, again, feel free to, to question us. Uh, uh, send anything that, that you're concerned about, questions you may have. Um, so any, anything along those lines, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much.